Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louise. I'm from Digital Leaders, and it's my pleasure today to be chairing this session. Uh, this is Stack It Up, Closing the IT, IT Skills Gap Post-Pandemic. Uh, we're excited to welcome our speaker today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just a couple of housekeeping before we get underway. I'm sure you're all used to the drill uh, now that we're in day four of Digital Leaders Week. But if you do have any questions here on the live session, do use the chat or the Q&A. Uh, it's available there now to um, enter in your questions while we have Martin available on the call. Um, we really recommend you do so. If you're tuning in later on, uh, do reach out uh, in the comments section, which is below the, um, the video here. So send in your questions on the comments and we'll be sure to pass that along. So we're joined by Martin Ewings today uh, as Brand Leader and Operations Director for Experius UK and Ireland. He is passionate about ensuring UK businesses have access to the IT skills they need to grow and thrive. This covers everything from educating the next generation of talent, accessing previously untapped diverse talent pools, and developing new methods of engaging with the workforce. So uh, we're very excited to have you join us today. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, uh, the floor is yours over to you. Great. Thank you, Louise. And uh, thank you, everybody, and welcome. Um, Yes, so my name is Martin Ewings and I'm the brand leader for Experis UK, as Louise said. Um, and for those who don't know, Experis is the uh, IT staffing and solutions arm of Manpower Group. Uh, and what that means is that in the UK, I have teams of specialist consultants who are aligned to technology practices, who talk to tens of thousands of candidates and, and hundreds of customers on a weekly basis. And what that means is uh, I have access to huge amounts of data on the UK marketplace uh, and we're able to draw really good insights as to, to how digitization and, and the push towards uh, technology advancement is impacting the ability to access those skills when organizations want to. Uh, but also we're able to see how the COVID pandemic has uh, impacted on our ability to attract the right skills. And that's the purpose of today's presentation. I want to share some of those insights with you to talk about how um, we're seeing strains and where we're seeing strains in the skills market uh, and then overlay the COVID pandemic uh, and show you how that has changed the way that uh, you may be able to engage the talent going forwards. So I think if we want to understand how the pandemic has influenced uh, the, the technology staffing market, we have to look at what the market was like prior to the COVID pandemic. And at that point, the advancements we'd seen in technology, uh, particularly around things like IoT, had led many to categorise what we were seeing as the fourth industrial revolution. And I think what really stood this out from, from previous industrial revolutions was the pace of change. The, the technology advancements we were seeing were, were not at a linear rate, they were an exponential rate. New technologies were coming and disappearing very, very quickly. And that put an absolutely unprecedented strain on the ability of organizations to access the talent they needed when they needed to do that. And it was having a fundamental shift on the, the world of work as we saw it. But at the same time, we also saw a shift in the way that employees wanted to be engaged by organizations. So there was much more talk about flexible working and the rigidity of, rigidity of a working week and a working day were being challenged. But we also saw a desire for more agility across a career. So the concept of a, a job for life had been consigned to the dustbin uh, and individuals were looking at flexibility to be able to move not only within organizations, but outside into other organizations and even other geographies uh, to advance their careers and ensure that they kept up to date. And that's another key factor we saw as well. Workers were looking at developing their skills. It was front and for, uh, front of their mind as they saw the advancement in technology taking such a pace they recognized that they had to keep their skills up to date if they were to continue to add value to themselves, but also to the customers that they served as well. So we saw those two key challenging forces um, as being the fundamental things that were shaping the world of work. And we called them the skills revolution. And then COVID hit. Uh, and as you can imagine, the, the, the pressures I've talked about there were only enhanced by COVID. And it's that, that tension between digitization and talent availability uh, compounded by the, uh, the demands of workers or the changing demands of workers that I want to talk about for the next 15 or 20 minutes um, and go through in this presentation. So first of all, what's the evidence that we have of this, this building tension? So we, we knew that digitization was already at scale. Nearly every organization uh, in the UK considered themselves to be a digital business or was certainly aspirational on that sense. Uh, the pandemic actually impacted and increased that desire for digitization. And that's what this slide here is showing. 
38% of organizations that we talked to said that the, as a result of the pandemic, they were accelerating their digitization programs. But what's really interesting is that of that 38%, 86% said that as a, as a direct result, they were going to be increasing or at least maintaining their workforce. And that's really interesting. The, the insight we draw there is that companies that are, are leading on digitization were also leading on job creation. So as they lent into the pandemic to accelerate digitization plans, they were increasing the demand in the marketplace and further stretching those skills gaps that I talked about. So therefore, you're seeing that organizations were already being challenged to find the skills they needed. And actually the pandemic is increasing that further. So we need to act now to build talent strategies that are gonna enable us to find the skills when we need them. So let's put that into some context. If we look here, these are the five major areas that organizations in the UK are telling us that they're gonna be investing in uh, by the end of 2025. And these shouldn't surprise you, um, cybersecurity, cloud computing, big data analytics. But I think what is interesting is this covers all industry sectors and covers all geographies within the UK. So this is a demand at scale. And then when you lay on top of that, the fact that this is going to be investments that will be made before the end of 2025, it's also a pressure of speed as well. So we have this scale and speed of transformation. And that's gonna, again, put more tension and pressure on, onto businesses to do this. Now, organizations want to be the employer of choice to be able to attract this talent going forwards to make sure that they don't fall behind as they make these investments. They want to be able to have that, that, um, that first mover advantage in certain skills areas to be able to access skills before they become commonplace in the market or rather the demand becomes commonplace. So how do organizations position themselves as employer of choice? Well, first of all, we need to understand the types of roles that this investment is going to put strains upon. What skills are we going to need in the coming years? So here we see the global top 10 most in-demand tech roles. And again, it's things like data analysis, um, big data specialist. Uh, we're looking here at cybersecurity experts, IoT specialists, things that you would expect to be in a top 10 list for global tech skill demand. But what's interesting again is that we've seen uh, skills come onto this and accelerate at the same time as others drop off quite quickly. If we'd have done this uh, presentation a couple of years ago, we would have seen a change in the order, but also a change in some of the skills that are on there. And I'm sure that if we ran this again in 18 months or two years, it would build a different picture. And already some of the newer entrants to this, things like cloud native developers, machine learning and AI, we're already seeing demand outstrip supply in the marketplace. And when you think of where we're going to be by 2025, the, the move towards 5G, the increase in remote work and remote consumerism, that demand is going to change. And this, uh, the understanding of the roles we're going to need is very much evolving at, at, at pace. Um, so we have to understand that it is fluid. So we cannot fix our talent strategy at one point. And to give you further context as well, uh, almost two thirds, 64% of organizations that we surveyed said that they struggled to find the skills today to implement the technology transformation programs they had. But 60% of organizations said that they expected to increase their demand on the uh, advanced digital skills that they want in the marketplace. So we're struggling to find skills today, but we're gonna lean into that further as we go forwards. One thing to bear in mind as well is these skills don't exist in isolation. There isn't a bubble here. And we're seeing salaries increase in these areas faster than we are in more traditional tech roles. And let's face it, these skills are the sexy, shiny new toys in any tech department's uh, itinerary. So best in class talent is going to gravitate towards these roles for, for financial reasons, but also for um, curiosity and for um, development of skill reasons as well. So not only are we going to see a challenge in these emerging skill demands that we have, but it's also going to place a strain on our existing BAU IT departments. And that's something that people building talent strategies need to understand. But that's the global view. So how does it look in the UK? Well, if we consider the marketplace as a whole, and I mean all job types in all sectors, tech roles made up over 50% of the in-demand roles today. And then when we replace that with emerging roles, so roles that we're seeing growing fast in the marketplace, nearly all of the top 10 were IT and tech roles. So we are seeing IT and tech not only dominate the market today, but will increasingly dominate the demand for skills that businesses are looking for. 
And we think that is the fundamental challenge for organizations as they look to digitize in the coming years. So let me just recap where we are so far. We know that digitization is critical and we know that organizations are not only progressing with this, but accelerating into it as a result of the pandemic. We know that we have talent gaps today for roles that we see. And we also know that those talent gaps are going to increase and expand as new roles come on board and demand increases. But that will also have an effect on the existing traditional IT departments as well. So I suppose that brings us to the key question, and, and that is, what can businesses do to meet the challenges that the skills revolution is going to give them? And that brings me on to the point that I want to talk about for the, for the rest of the presentation. And I think as businesses, we have to change the way that we assess and build talent strategies. We have to move away from being just consumers of talent and become more builders of skills. And what I mean by that is that we're seeing the pace of technology advancement at such a level that the skills that we prepare for today are out of date very quickly. So the hires that you're making today, if you purely hire them on their ability to do the job you require today, they may become obsolete within two years. And that investment therefore is wasted. And that poses a big challenge to organizations. How do you hire people that are able to grow with your organization and to meet challenges that you can't yet see in the marketplace? So that brings me on to this next slide, which is about emerging skills. Now, if you look at these emerging skills, again, I, I don't think anything will shock you here. Things like problem solving, analytical thinking, resilience, stress tolerance, leadership, emotional intelligence. These are things that uh, are commonplace within organizations. They are not unique to technology, but this is what businesses are telling us are critical to their talent strategies. So ask yourself the question, when, when you are looking for roles today, what forms the assessment criteria? When you give job requirements to organizations like mine to go to market and find you talent, what critical skills are you listing? Because we're seeing organizations still look for hard skills and experience as the defining factor of assessing talent when we send them in. Now, in that case, are you just building yourself up for a workforce that will become obsolete? Are you hiring people that can uh, develop the software platform you have today? Or are you hiring people that can understand and develop the platform for tomorrow as well? So I think it's that, that focusing on capabilities and putting these front and center of assessment strategies that are gonna support us. But to do that, you also need to build in place uh, an always on development strategy so that you hire predominantly with capabilities in mind with an understanding that you'll be developing the hard skills that go with the roles as the demand increases. And it's that always on development that has to go hand in hand with putting capabilities front and center. But another advantage of, of putting capabilities at the heart of how we assess talent is actually, as I said at the start here, these aren't unique to technology. And if we actually use these as the criteria of assessing talent, it opens up talent pools in a way that we haven't seen before to the tech market. Now, we know that diversity is absolutely critical for our organizations uh, and not just to close the skills gap, but also to make our businesses fit for purpose, to, to reflect the consumers and the society that we work within. And actually putting capabilities first and center means you can assess talent from those pools and bring them into your business, understanding their capabilities. And I'll give you a, a few examples. So Experis work with businesses to actually look at tapping into talent pools they previously haven't done. And as part of Manpower Group, we actually manage what's called the Career Transition Program, where we support people leaving the armed forces coming into City Street and finding meaningful employment. Now, when we look at the population of people leaving the armed forces, we absolutely see things like problem solving, creativity, certainly resilience and stress tolerance, but also leadership as well. That community has these capabilities in spades. They might not have exactly the technology platforms that we're looking for, but they certainly have technology mindsets as well. So we work with organizations to build training plans, partnering with best in class training providers so that we find individuals with the capabilities, work in partnership with organizations to then give the hard skills around that capability so that the organization is left with someone fit for purpose today, but who's also able then to develop and go forwards with the organization and grow as they grow their strategy. And another example I can give you, um, we're actually working with partners at the moment to access a neurodiverse talent pool. Now, again, when I look at these capabilities, 
we see things like critical thinking, analytical thinking, problem solving. But this is a, a criminally underused talent population. And we now work with organizations specializing in this area to support businesses to tap into that pool. Now, you may have to adjust the way you engage with, communicate with, and, and manage that pool of talent. But with some adjustment, you're able then to access people that can provide excellent service today, but also have the capabilities to learn and develop and go on that journey with you as a business. But just hiring new talent into our sector is not going to close the skills gap on its own. We have to look to actually develop what we have as well, those already in our businesses. So this next slide is looking at just that. And it's what we call the identification of skills adjacencies. And what I mean by that is looking at people within your organizations who have those capabilities that we've talked about and the proportion of the skills that you're going to need in the future, understanding that gap and then preparing them for that journey to become the talent that you're looking for. You're able to then move them away from declining areas of your business and less in demand skills and move them into profiles that will be in demand in the future. Now, typically organizations have been quite reluctant to invest in this space. And, and I understand why, because when we survey millennials, they, they typically say that two years is about the length of time they want to spend uh, in any one job or with any one organization. So I understand the logic that says, why would I invest in that person when they're gonna go and take that capability to a competitor? But I, I honestly think we don't have a choice here. Uh, I think it is the right thing to do, um, but I also think, uh, as I say, we, we don't really have another option. And I think organizations need to develop a, a healthier, more flexible mindset when it comes to this. We need to be comfortable that people will leave, that people will learn and people will return. Uh, and what I mean by that is if, if we create an environment that's a positive experience for a worker, if they move away and go to another organization, learn new things, take on board new processes and, and, and skills, they may come back to our organization, bringing that knowledge with them and helping to raise the bar of standards with our business. So we have to kind of build that, that culturing of an alumni and positively engaging with them, even when they're not employed by us. But I also want to go back to what I said right at the top of the presentation, that we see two key areas of tension. One was the skills gap caused by technology advancement, and the other one was the changing of employees' demands from employers. Now, as I mentioned, development is absolutely front and center of employees' uh, expectations. And as you get into the younger populations, below 40 and below 30, that becomes even more critical for them. So actually, in trying to solve the skills gap by developing people, you're actually helping to solve some of the challenges that employees are facing in the marketplace. By building that always-on development plan, they will see you as an employer of choice. This will not only make you more attractive in the marketplace to new talent, but it will also help you retain the talent you have, because why would they need to go elsewhere if they're getting the development that they crave? And we're helping businesses here as well. Um, we've built a, a platform called the Experis Career Accelerator, uh, and we've partnered with a company called Future Fit uh, AI, uh, where we've mapped out 30,000 different IT skills uh, across about 10,000 different IT jobs. And we've built individual pathways to 25 job roles that we think will be critical in, in the new future. So things like cloud architects, DevOps engineers, uh, Java full stack and, and Python developers, those types of skills. So a candidate now can come onto the platform through assessment, understand uh, how they rank and how their skills make up. They can also understand what the market is going to demand in the future and the confidence that we've done that assessment for them. They can then choose where they want to go in the coming years. And we then understand the gap. We show the candidate the gap from where they are today and where they need to get to. And then we help bridge the gap. And we've partnered with global training providers to provide curated courses with certifications that candidates can then take. And organizations can do this as well. They can do this assessment to take their staff on that journey. And if anyone wants to learn more about the Experis Career Accelerator, please reach out to me uh, after this uh, presentation today. But if I move on to um, this next slide, I think the message I want to get across here is that organizations are telling us that they are trying to do multiple things to solve the challenges that the skills revolution poses to them. So on the left hand side, you see you know, changes to the way they operate, either outsourcing or automating a lot of the work that they see. And then in the middle, we see a lot of organizations talking about um, upskilling and, and reskilling staff, some of it through formal training and others through exposure, which is a, an interesting uh, proposal to assume that your staff will, will be upskilled. 
And there's also the classical recruitment, dipping into the permanent market, the uh, interim and temporary market to meet the, uh, the challenges that you face. And all of these are valid, but no one is going to provide a solution to the, uh, the skills revolution. So organizations need to work with partners that can build a balanced and blended model to meet the challenges that they face. So it's with that in mind that we have built our four Bs model, as we call it, our build, buy, borrow, and bridge. I'll explain what I mean by, by the four Bs. So build is where you would work with uh, partner organizations to create the talent that you're looking for, to be that engine that, that actually builds the talent um, that you need now and, and in the future. With buy, it's about dipping into the marketplace to recruit permanently the type of talent that you need for today, but also to meet the skills gap for tomorrow. So that's classical permanent recruitment. When we talk about borrow, we mean uh, integrating into the, the contract, the interim and the freelance market. And that might help you meet a spike in demand through projects today, or you may have a critical need in your business. That you don't find those skills in your permanent workforce and you need to supplement them. That's dipping into borrow. And then bridge. Uh, that's around the uh, skills adjacencies that I've talked about. What you have within your organization, do you understand the capabilities that you have? And are you able to move them around within your organization to get the best people in the best roles with the ability to grow in the future as they want to? This also means bridging people away from your organization. It might be needed that you actually have to exit people. Can you do so in a way that's respectful and a positive experience so those individuals can go away, learn new skills and processes, and at some point, they may be relevant to come back into your organization and bring that knowledge with you. Now, we see this very much as a, a living model. There is no one of those Bs that will solve your challenges for you. But you need to partner with an organization that will be able to give you access to all four, that will be able to pull on them in, in, in different demands as your demands change. Because when we talk to organizations and implement this model, uh, where we look at things like um, the skills that the organization requires, uh, the supply options they have for those skills, when we look at the time they've got to plan for some of these things, but also budget constraints as well. It's not relevant that just one of these will be able to solve that. Sometimes you need to be able to build all four into a, a talent solution as well. So in summary, um, I think what I want to, to, to get across today is that companies cannot delay digitization and they're not delaying. In fact, they're accelerating into it as a result of the pandemic. That's put a strain on an on already unprecedentedly stretched talent pool. Nearly every company now is a tech business, and as such, they require tech skills. And, and digitization is driving their ability to remain relevant to the business. So it's an increasingly pressing challenge for them. I think a key message to take away is the, the assumption that you will be able to hire the skills as and when you need them may not be true anymore. So you have to start planning for that eventuality. How else are you going to tap into skills and talent other than just going to market and buying or borrowing. So developing IT talent ourselves as a collective group is more important now than ever before to enable you to be agile, efficient, effective, and competitive in the marketplace. And clearly, as we've seen, the investment in these technologies is absolutely critical to businesses. And in order to, order to maximize the return on that, you need to have a talent strategy aligned to your technology strategy one that is a blended model that enables you to pull on a number of levers to meet the demand that you see in the marketplace. Well, that's my thoughts for the day. So I'll, I'll pass back to Louise now and um, see if there's any questions from the floor. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, there's so much, so much good insight in there. So really, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, we do have time for questions. Pop them in the chat or in the Q&A um, and I can um, pick them out and ask Martin on your behalf. Uh, I'll ask a few to get us going. Um, and just a reminder, if you're watching this later on, do uh, enter your questions in down below. I'll be sure to pass it along to uh, Martin uh, at a later stage. So, uh, oh, just a quick one, Martin, how can we get in touch with you? Have you got a final yeah, slide there? I, I do. I don't know if it has my contact details on it, actually, but my, my contact details um, are uh, my email address is martin.ewings at experis.co.uk. Okay, that's easy enough to, to remember. So perfect. If you think of a question later on or want to get in touch, do reach out um, and equally just reach out to the Digital Leaders team if you want us to link you up. Um, so let's see. So touching upon diversity, firstly, yep. um, what, what do you think businesses can do to help encourage a more diverse work workforce in, in the IT space? Okay, um, very good and very relevant question. I, I would probably start by 
taking a step back for that and saying uh, um, a key word missing from that question is inclusion as well. Um, I think organizations need to understand is the environment they're providing for their already diverse workers um, fit for purpose? Is, is it attractive when they go to the marketplace to try and increase the, the talent pool that they have access to? Um, so that's something that you have to do. I, I think you need to engage with your employees in that way. You have to have forums available that enable employees to voice their opinions on how your organization is. And you have to be open to change and develop as well. But then when it comes to just attracting talent, um, I think clearly having a diverse interview panel is absolutely critical, not just to ensure that you are selecting and assessing talent in the right way, but also enabling those candidates who want to join your business to be able to um, ask correct questions to, to really understand what the makeup of your organization is like. And I would also lean quite heavily into um, the use of AI for assessment as well. We need to try and drive out conscious and unconscious bias when we are going through talent selection and assessment. And there's a lot of good technology in the marketplace that, that enables us to do just that. So I'd say it's a combination of, of those, three, those three main things in the main. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on um, sort of the remote work workforce. Obviously we've all had to um, work from home in the pandemic, but um, what are your thoughts on that, on, on that landscape, how that, how that might change? Um, particularly in people starting a job remotely and um, integrating with the team. Yeah, it, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? I'm, I'm mm. working with a number of colleagues today who I've worked with now for over a year and I've never met them. Um, but it doesn't feel that way. Uh, it, it, I see them most days and, and we have conversations and actually the interactions are probably more personal than they would have been if it was predominantly telephone based with the occasional face to face meeting. Um, but it is something that organisations need to um, spend time thinking about because uh, it is critical that an employee gets to understand the culture and the DNA and the ambition of an organization and also that the organization understands those individuals uh, and I'd, I'd expand the answer as well to include your existing staff. Um, it's been over a year now since we've had people in our offices in anger and we shouldn't assume that the motivations and the desire of the people that worked for us has remained the same in that, in that 12 to 18 month period. So I think we almost need to go back to, to scratch when we're talking to our existing staff about what their ambitions are, what are their desires? How do, how do they see the future world of work working? Because I think we may see some tension as, as you know, we've seen recently in surveys that more organizations are saying that they're increasingly expecting workers to come back to the office. That's not necessarily reflected by workers. So unless we reach out and have that dialogue, there may become a tension where actually you're trying to fill an empty bucket because staff are leaving. Um, so you know, understanding new starters is one thing, understanding your existing workforces is quite the other. Absolutely. And the, a bit of tension might arise too when maybe half the people come back, half are still remotely. What about that water cooler moment? How do they, um, you, you don't want people left out of the conversation, which remote workers pre-pandemic always had to battle with. So any thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah uh, I, that is the case. And also you have to think about um, communication. Uh, at the moment, everyone is working on Teams or Zoom, so everyone is in the same position. If you go back to an office and, and half of the room are in there physically and half are dialing in through a technology, how's that experience? And the, the water cooler moments you talk about, you know, what's the equivalent of that in the digital world? So organizations need to think about those larger gatherings and team meetings and how it's going to be productive for everybody, because actually research has shown that some individuals have felt more able to express themselves and get their opinions across and add value than they had done previously in more physical environments. So let's not lose that. Let's try and find that blend that, that works for everybody. And there's some amazing technologies, I think, coming through in meeting rooms and different um, clever uses, uh, clever, clever pieces of kit to ensure that people have good experience with that. Um, just want to touch kind of you know, follow on to that. What about young people um, off like sort of we've been discussing it um, here at Digital Leaders, how um, a young person will learn so much about what they overhear or the pre conversations to a meeting with their leader and things like that. Thoughts on um, uh, how you can potentially create that foster that environment for a young person um, in this new landscape. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, how organizations approach training and development um, mm -hmm. has changed and will continue to change. So um, you, you, I, I think 
our experiences that, that, that younger people tend to like that blend of self-serve training as well as some formal elements as well. So you have to have that access to always on development and kind of at demand um, learning as well, uh, access to those tools and, and data. But I'd also say that, that as we move to more of a, a hybrid way of working, we need to not underestimate the, the ability of the, uh, I want to hesitate to use the phrase, the older part of the workforce to influence, develop and, and coach that younger workforce. It's not just about understanding technology and understanding um, how, how the, the demands of the hard skills that we talked about. It's also understanding about communication and mm. about emotional intelligence and, and the, building the future leaders of tomorrow. And we shouldn't underestimate the impact that the existing workforce would have on that. So find ways of still maintaining that community feel through either coaching or mentoring relationships um, to, to make sure that the, the cultural and DNA that, of your company that actually um, drove high performance is still there for the, for the youth that you're hiring. Absolutely. Uh, going back to the values, isn't it? Um, so the government has uh, introduced the Kickstart initiative as part of the pandemic recovery. Um, and uh, given the gap between digital skills young people learn in school and those they need, which you're touching on now, those they need for the workforce, uh, do you think this program could be effective in the IT space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is one one aspect of, of, of talent development that we need to look at. And for those that don't know, the Kickstart is a program that, um, initiated by government uh, for 16 to 24 year olds to, to try and find those people work um, who may have lost work as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, we're working with people like the Prince's Trust to see how do we actually tap into this community um, of, of youth identify the capabilities we've talked about and then build the hard skills on top and work with uh, in partnership with businesses to, to provide the meaningful employment. Uh, and I think absolutely um, programs like this uh, have a, a path forwards. And you know, as with any government initiative off the back of, of the pandemic, it will have a shelf life, but that doesn't mean that organizations like ourselves and other businesses out there can't and won't continue to, to, to grow these sorts of programs because absolutely trying to to tap into those capabilities as opposed to the hard skills and experience is it, critical to, to meeting a skills gap. Excellent, Martin, I'm going to bring this session to a close, but I really wanna thank you for taking the time. You have clear passion for this topic and uh, plenty of knowledge to share. So uh, on behalf of the audience here and those watching later on on the recording, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll see you at the next uh, Digital Leaders Week session, I'm sure so shortly. Have a great afternoon.